All right. Philip Freeman, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be here. So you got a biography out about Alexander the Great. Now, there are a lot of books and biographies about Alexander the Great, ancient ones. We got Arians, Campaigns of Alexander. Uh, Why did you think that we need another Alexander the Great biography? Well, there are. You're right. There are there are a lot, both ancient and modern. Arian, of course, I think is the, the very best of the ancient biographies. And there's some very good modern biographies. When I wrote this a few years back, it, there, there really weren't any that had been done recently. There have been a couple that have been done since. But my goal in writing this was really just to tell the story of Alexander for a modern audience. I, I want to be accurate. I want to be academic and all of that. But I really wanted to put it in the form of a story story that people could read and feel like they could really get to know this man. This is a book about more than just battles, although I do talk about the details of battles and such, but it's really much more of a book about the person of Alexander, who he was, what motivated him is best that we can tell looking back over 2,000 years. Yeah, I love the way you wrote it because it does read like this, like like Game of Thrones or The Godfather, particularly (laughs) in those that early part. And we'll talk about that, sort of the succession between Philip his Alexander's dad and Alexander. There's a lot of assassinations and killings going on. Yes. But I loved how you wrote that. It just, it read like this, like this, like a really good murder mystery novel. Oh, I had so much fun with it. Thank you. So before we talk about Alexander the Great, let's talk about why we call him Alexander the Great. How big of an empire did he amass? How long did it take him? Why are we still talking about him you know, 2000 years later? Well, he's a fascinating character because what he did was really amazing. It really was great. He started off being a, a struggling king of a very small kingdom in, uh, in northern Greece, and he, he conquered the world, basically, uh, all the way from Greece to Egypt, across what's now Iraq and Iran, all the way to uh, what's modern India. No one had ever had an empire that big before. He conquered the Persian Empire, which made up most of his, his realm. But he uh, he did more than that. He, it was an enormous empire. Imagine starting off in Seattle and conquering the United States all the way to New England and Florida 2,000 years ago. That's what Alexander did. It was uh, an enormous geographical area, an area uh, very populous, made up of incredibly diverse people, languages, cultures, many of them very warlike. And Alexander was able to do this in a period of about 11 years when he was very young. He started this when he was about 20 years old and he finished just before his 33rd birthday when he died. So he was able to conquer most of the known world of the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean and Near East at a time when nobody had ever done anything like that before and especially had never done it so fast. Yeah, when you when you hear when you realize how young he was, it makes you feel like a slacker. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julius Caesar, when he was uh, in his early thirties, came across a statue of Alexander uh, when he was in, in Spain. Julius Caesar was really just starting off, and he wept because Alexander had conquered the world uh, at a time when uh, Julius Caesar was still a junior officer. So, yeah, it made, made me wonder what I've done with my life. <laughs> so, in the beginning, you you make the case as well as a general of Alexander the Great that Alexander wouldn't have been able to do what he did without the foundation that his father, King Philip of Macedonia, laid. So let's talk about this first. Let's talk about the Macedonians, because as you said, there was sort of this northern city-state or you know, call, I don't know what you would call it, just an area of Greece, sort of the backwoods, the back country, but somehow it managed to rise to power. So kind of give us background, what, what was Macedonia? What was their role in, in Greek culture at the time of Alexander or before Alexander the Great? Right. Well, Macedonia had had been a part of ancient Greek history for a long time. Uh, They were on the northern fringes, though. The uh, Athenians, the Spartans, the Thebans, uh, all of the civilized Greek people to the south saw them as their barbarians uh, to the north. Uh, And at a time when the Athenians were inventing democracy and you had the rule of the people spreading across Greece, the Macedonians were still a kingdom ruled by uh, a king with uh, pretty much absolute power very much like a, a a warlord, somebody from Game of Thrones, which you mentioned. So the, the Greeks always looked at the Macedonians as their backcountry cousins, always looked down on them. But they were a powerful kingdom, but they really, uh, until the time of Philip, they were always being threatened with war, always being threatened by being torn apart. And what Philip did was Philip was able to take the Macedonians, take these wild people who were natural great warriors, but he was able to form 
transform them into an army using the techniques that he had learned from the Greek cities to the south. And when you combine that sort of natural talent and bravery and, and, and force of the Macedonians with the discipline that Philip learned, military discipline that he learned from the Greek city-states, they were an incredible force to be reckoned with. Uh, and Philip was able not only to survive when he rose to power in Macedonia, but he was able to take over uh, really most of Greece, except for Sparta, and, and make it part of his own Macedonian empire, with the aim, ultimately, as he always said, of invading the Persian Empire, which everybody thought was a, a pretty ridiculous idea. And why did, well, why did Philip want to take over... Greece. What was his goal there? Oh, I think he was like many kings and tyrants and rulers through the ages. He wanted power. And also he lived in a, in a society that was like, think of the Middle Ages. And, and you had to conquer, you had to push forward, or you were falling back. And you always had to press forward. You always had to give your warriors uh, something to fight for. You always had to give them loot from sacked cities. It was a, a military society, so it had to have some sort of a, of a military purpose to it. And I I think that was a, a big part of it. I think he also wanted legitimacy. He wanted to be recognized that he was Greek, and he wanted to be accepted by the Greeks to the south. And he's also, he took advantage of sort of the tumult that was going in, and on in a lot of the Greek city-states. I think a lot of times when we think of ancient Greece, we think of you know the white statues and the pillars and it's all, but it was a very chaotic time, particularly around this time, you know, just couple a generation before Socrates was assassinated there's this whole you know political intrigue and turmoil going on in Athens and it sounds like Philip was able to take advantage of that. He was. Uh, what happened in the generation before Philip, really, at the end of the 400s BC, was a great Peloponnesian war between Athens and Sparta, a 30-year war, which was just, imagine World War II lasting for 30 years. It was that level of, of devastation and death and destruction. And so Greece was exhausted when Philip came to the throne. So that helped him. He was able to step in. They, they were exhausted, but they were down, but not out. They were still very powerful warriors, especially the city of Thebes, which rose to power after Athens and Sparta had exhausted themselves. So they were uh, formidable enemies. They, they really were. But Philip was able to to step into this power vacuum uh, and take advantage of it. All right, so let's talk about Alexander. The birth of Alexander is sort of shrouded in legend. It talk is. About when you that. read about... Yeah, when you read about heroes uh, in the ancient world, uh, things often get put in mythological terms. And, and so there's all these legends that he was like born of a god or like there was like thunder and lightning. It was like weird stuff going on. Right, there was. Uh, the, the night that he was born, there was supposedly a thunderstorm. His conception, Philip was never quite sure, according to the stories, if he was actually the father, because there was a claim that Zeus was really the father. That was a fairly standard sort of thing to do. You wanted to have an ancestor who was a, a god. If you could be the actual son of a god, that was a, that was great propaganda. That was something maybe, you know, most people wouldn't believe it, but some people would. And so I think Alexander himself really wasn't quite sure. His mother told him that he was divine, that he was special. His mother Olympias was a, a tremendous influence in his life. Well, talk about the influence that Olympias had on him. Yes, she came from, she was a, a princess in an ancient country called Epirus, which is basically modern Albania. And she came into the court of Macedonia and became one of many of Philip's wives. She was fairly young at the time. She was a very smart, very determined woman. And her goal in life was to get her son, Alexander, on the throne because there were other contenders, both uh, children of Philip and other members of the Macedonian nobility. So uh, she fought very hard. She had some some rather exotic ways. There's a story that uh, one night Philip came to crawl into bed with her and he found a giant snake wrapped around her. She uh, was uh, doing some sort of strange wild ritual with a snake. And the sources say that after that, Philip really was a little bit intimidated and, and didn't go back to bed with her. So she was exotic, certainly, but a, a very determined woman who lived uh, all throughout. She outlived her son, Alexander, and was there all the time pushing for him. 
Well, that religiosity of Olympias, it seemed to rub off on Alexander as well. Throughout his life, he was very pious or devout or religious. He was. And it's very easy for us uh, from a modern point of view to be cynical and say, oh, he was just manipulating religion. He didn't really take it seriously. Uh, And to a certain extent, he was manipulating it. But I think he was also very serious and very devout. The Greeks really tended to be quite serious about their religion. They, They asked questions. Philosophers did. Some of them even questioned the existence of the gods. But for the most part, the Greeks were really quite serious in their religion. And and I think Alexander uh, certainly followed that model. And we'll talk a bit about more in that experience he had in Egypt when he began his campaign. But let's talk about him as Alexander as a child. Were there signs when he was a boy that he would grow up to become Alexander the Great? Well, there were. And again, when you have stories about great people of the ancient world, you often have childhood stories of, of great things that they do. But I think with Alexander, some of these were, were quite true. There, uh, when he was a young man, he uh, wanted a horse. And there was this great horse that was brought before Philip named Bucephalus. And it was untamable. Nobody could, this, this magnificent beast, nobody could control it. But Alexander was smart enough to notice that what seemed to upset Bucephalus was seeing his own shadow. So Alexander very calmly went up to him and took Bucephalus and turned him to face the sun so that he couldn't see his own shadow. And then after he calmed him down, he jumped up on top of him and, and rode Bucephalus across the plain. And, uh, and he came back and, and, and Philip said, you know, my son, you need to find new kingdoms. Macedonia isn't going to be big enough for you. So there's some wonderful stories like that. Some of them might not be true, but uh, I think some of them are. And then also is he had a unique education because his personal tutor was the great philosopher, the philosopher, the teacher, Aristotle. Yes, I mean, what more could you want as a teenager for several years? He, if, well, first of all, Alexander was tutored by by several excellent tutors who who taught him Greek. He knew Homer, he knew mathematics, he knew uh, all the subjects a man should know. But Aristotle was his tutor, the the great Aristotle, the the one Dante called the master of all who know. He uh, it was certainly one of the most intelligent men ever. And like Aristotle's own teacher Plato, he explored a wide variety of of, of subjects. But Aristotle. Aristotle also was a great experimental scientist, really one of the first. Whereas Plato would theorize about things, you know, what what animals are like, Aristotle would be out waiting in the swamp collecting tadpoles to dissect. Uh, So he was a a wonderful teacher and a great influence on uh, on Alexander. Do we know why Aristotle decided to take that role? I mean, because he was like, you know, he was in he was in Athens, you know, he was a student of Plato, but he decided to go to the backwoods of Macedonia to to tutor this king's kid. Yes. I mean, Aristotle actually wasn't uh, from Athens. A- Aristotle grew up in Macedonia. His father was the, the court physician in Macedonia, so he was very familiar uh, with the wild and crazy ways of Macedonia. But also, uh, things were getting a little difficult in Athens, and so uh, he, I, I think, left just to uh, avoid problems and anti-Macedonian feelings. And so, he, I'm sure he was also very well paid. So, he went up and he taught Alexander and his small group of friends. You can still visit the site. It's uh, on the the side of a mountain, and it's a a beautiful place. I can just uh, uh, imagine learning from Aristotle at that setting. Well, according to lore, we don't know if this is true, but that Alexander during his campaigns supposedly sent stuff back to Aristotle, like animals and furs and things. Right, samples and things that he found. uh, uh, Aristotle practically invented biology, and so Alexander was always sending back unique animals and plants and such things to his old teacher Aristotle all throughout his 11-year campaign. Well, another interesting part of Alexander's childhood, what we'd call childhood now, is when he's a teenager, his dad actually put him in charge of military, of the military. Like he was a captain in the military, like 16 years old. Right. 16 years old, he was put in charge. He was, uh, Alexander learned a lot of wonderful theory in biology and mathematics and literature, but he was also trained from the very beginning by Macedonian soldiers, some of the toughest soldiers in the world. He was trained in the practical arts, the practical arts of fighting and leadership. And so from an early time, Alexander was put in charge of leading men in battle. And so uh, when he was 16 years old, he was serving as a, a, a captain in the army of Philip and getting Uh, very much on the ground training in military matters. So the part in your book that started reading like a mafioso or like a Game of Thrones is the succession between Philip and Alexander. Uh, So the interesting part first is that at first Philip, you know, he wasn't always sure that Alexander was his son. And there's actually a moment where Philip says, no, yeah, you're not going to be my heir, Alexander. 
Right. Uh, and this was uh, when Alexander was in his late teens, and Philip was getting ready to go off on the invasion of Persia. And there was a lot of pressure on Philip. to. Uh, he had had daughters, he had had one son who was mentally handicapped, but he didn't have a, aside from Alexander, he didn't have a, a, a healthy son who he could leave the throne to. And that bothered some of the Macedonian nobility because they saw Alexander as a, a as a as a half Macedonian, not really one of them, and they really wanted uh, Philip to marry and, and sire a son with an old Macedonian family. And so Philip listened to them, and he sent Olympias and Alexander away and removed Alexander at least temporarily from the line of succession. But then, after he was unable to uh, have another son, and he was just getting ready to leave on the uh, military expedition, he realized he he couldn't just leave without nobody as an heir. And so he brought Alexander back and uh, reinstated him as his heir, which I imagine made Alexander a bit resentful. Yeah, I could see that being really awkward. Like, if you think Thanksgiving dinner is awkward, imagine being like, "You're not going to be the heir." Oh yeah, you are going to be the heir again. Exactly. Exactly. So, and then all during this time, you know, before Philip was going to go off to Persia, he was worried about having a successor in case he died out there. But there was also this like, you know, uh, inner intrigue going on. People were wanting to assassinate Philip. Why were, why were these, the, why were there conspiracies to get rid of Philip? What was going on in Macedonia? Well, Macedonia, uh, truly, it, it, reading about its history is reading the Game of Thrones. There was plots, counterplots, murders, intrigue, treachery. Most Macedonian kings were assassinated. That's how most of them died. And it was unusual for uh, one to live and die uh, in old age. And, and so there were always plots. There were always factions. And so people from the Athenians to the Persians themselves, the Persians knew what was going on. They were keeping a close eye uh, on things. There were factions within the Macedonian nobility. So there were plenty of people who might want to see Philip dead. And so in the end, one of them killed him. And do we know who, who that guy was? Well, we know something about the man who killed him, at least who was the assassin. He was a very minor figure. But the, the real question is, who was behind him? That's the, the, the what people have struggled with, and nobody's really figured it out. Was it the Athenians? That's what some people say. Was it the Persians? Was it just an angry, jilted former lover of Philip who was behind it all? So nobody really knows. But the upshot is that Philip was murdered just before before he was getting ready to leave on his great Persian expedition. And Alexander was there. A lot of people, of course, in later years thought that Olympias maybe was behind it, or maybe Alexander himself. So that period when Alexander became the king, there's that's a really in any moment there's succession, there's always that there's always a possibility that the succession won't go as planned. There's all these people fighting for, you know, no, actually he's not the heir, I'm the heir. Was Alexander able to galvanize the Macedonians and say, yes, I'm the guy, come follow me? He was. Uh, he had proven himself as a military leader already, but he was uh, he was 20 years old. A lot of them saw him as a half-Macedonian kid who was trying to step into his father's very big shoes. And so there were a lot of people who were against him, and certainly whether or not the Athenians or other Greeks or Persians were behind it, they certainly took advantage of the assassination of Philip and tried to thwart Alexander at the very beginning. But through matters of persuasion, through proof of his military and organizational ability, Alexander showed them that he really was worthy to take over the Macedonian throne. And he established himself and he you know, showed the Greeks that he was, you know, he was serious. He was uh, not afraid to knock some heads together. And so he consolidated his power to the south in Greece. And then he launched a campaign in the north up in the Danube River Valley, which was a great training session for his invasion of the Persian Empire. It showed his military skill, his leadership, and it secured his northern borders before he would head out east and invade Persia. Well, I was impressed during this time with Alexander was his political astuteness. Like he understood that there were people in his father's court or in his military leadership that were probably like against him, but he kept them on anyways. But then he, there were some people he knew he had to get rid of right away. Like he knew the right people to fire and the right, right people to quit. Or keep. Right. Yeah. He, he was very smart. I mean, plenty of people have looked at Alexander for lessons of, of, of business leadership. And there, there are 
of, or good lessons there. And knowing who you have to get rid of, but if you do just a general purge and get rid of everybody, then you remove all the talent that you need. And that's certainly not a way to develop loyalty to you in the future. Uh, and so he, Alexander was sparing and he used violence like a surgeon's knife rather than like a, a club to hit people with. Sometimes he did have people killed. Sometimes he had them executed, but he really preferred to try to win them over and to try to make good use of their talents if he could. So he did that initial like training ground, securing his northern borders in the Danube River Valley. But then he started turning his attention towards Greece and some of these city-states that have been belligerent and kind of getting in the way. And one of his initial campaigns was against the Thebans. Tell us about these guys and why were they such a formidable foe and why did Alexander feel he had to put them in check? Well, the Thebans had filled the power vacuum in Greece just after the Peloponnesian War, when uh, Athens and Sparta were were downed, but not out. Uh, they were weakened. And the Thebans were a tremendous military force. They, had, were, they were the very first ones to beat the Spartans. The Spartans really had never been seriously defeated in battle until after the Peloponnesian War, the uh, Thebans were able to meet them on the field of battle and beat them. They were incredible, incredibly trained, professional soldiers. Philip had learned so much. He was a hostage, a young man among the Thebans, and that's where he learned a lot of his military skills. The Thebans had something called the, the Sacred Band, which I've never seen anything like it in history. It was a, a, it was a group of 150 male couples who were same-sex couples who were lovers uh, who fought together. So you had 300 men who were superbly trained, probably one of the best military forces ever, and they fought all the harder because they were fighting beside people that they loved. And so Alexander was able to, uh, he marched on Thebes and he said, surrender. I, I'm the boss now. My father's gone. The Thebans said, no, we're not going to surrender to a kid. Uh, and so Alexander, by using his skill and siege warfare and, and other things, he took the city of Thebes and destroyed it. And he uh, gave a very specific object lesson to the rest of Greece by basically killing or enslaving everybody in Thebes, uh, so that the Athenians, the Spartans, and the rest would think twice before rebelling. While he was off in Persia, uh, he would uh, simply send back a message and say, remember Thebes. And so he used violence uh, on a grand scale, but a very selective scale in order to impress the people of Greece. Yeah, that was sort of his modus operandi if there was a, a city that just just didn't didn't give up or didn't surrender right away. He would make sure that he would teach a lesson to them, but to everyone else. Absolutely. So uh, you mentioned he used uh, siege warfare during this time, um, and he made some innovations there. Besides that, like what did, what sort of other innovations did Alexander introduce? Um, you know, strategically, tactically, that made him such a formidable military leader. Well, really, organization on the battlefield and off the battlefield. One thing that he was able to do, which is uh, something I, I, I share with my students in class, the Greek hoplite army, the heavily armed infantrymen who were in Athens, Sparta, Thebes, uh, Macedonia, they were a, a, a very tough bunch. And they had these spears. In the ancient world, you really didn't throw your spear. That was a, that was a last resort. So they would have spears that were maybe eight feet long that they would use to poke and stab their enemy. Well, what Alexander came up with was the idea of a what he called a sarissa. He and his father came up with it. It was an 18-foot long spear. And you can imagine a spear that's 18 feet long can reach through just about any military line. The problem is, if you have 100 men carrying 18-foot spears, they have to be superbly trained so they don't get entangled with each other. But if you can get 100 men who can move like a machine with 18-foot spears, then you can press your way through just about any heavily armed infantry line. Uh, that was just one of the innovations of Alexander. But he had a great many others, and, and really one of his main ones was speed. Nobody ever moved as fast as Alexander. You'd be uh, getting ready for a battle in three days with him and then find out he was right there on your doorstep. And in battle, one of his tricks was to rush in very fast with his horsemen before anybody could even get their arrows ready to get underneath the range of the, of the archer. So uh, speed in all of its different aspects was a major factor of Alexander. We're going to take a quick break for your word from our sponsors. And now back to the show. 
So he, he gets Greece under control, the Peloponnesian Peninsula under control. Uh, then he moves over to Persia. And it seemed like initially he was just focusing on Greek cities that were under Persian control, correct? Right. The Greek cities on the western coast of what's now Turkey, they had been Greek for a thousand years. The Greek settlers, all on both sides of the Aegean, and they, the ones on the uh, what's now the Turkish coast, uh, had been a part of the Persian Empire for a couple of hundred years. And they were generally fairly happy. Sometimes they weren't, sometimes they were. But people thought that uh, Alexander were, was going to restrict his invasion of Persia to just trying to take the Greek cities of Asia Minor. Ephesus and all of the rest along the coast. And he did. And, and when he finished, they thought that probably he would stop. But that's the thing about Alexander. He never stopped. He always kept going. Well, so yeah, why did he keep going after he got that under control? Why did he keep going after Persia? It's funny. I think he, he, I don't think it was that he wanted money, that he wanted to sack cities or anything like that. I think he wanted power, like uh, many uh, people through history. Uh, So I think it was certainly about power. I think it was about reputation. His hero was Achilles from the Trojan War. And Achilles gloried in the fact that he was the greatest warrior ever. And Alexander, I think, aspired to be like that. He slept with Homer's Iliad uh, underneath his pillow every night with the stories of Achilles. And so I think it was uh, a lot of it was that I think a lot of it was just wanting to prove that he could do it, that this kid from Macedonia could actually do it. And so he kept pushing farther and farther along the coast, the Mediterranean coast, and then eventually inland. Well, speaking of his admiration of Achilles, like one of the first things he does when he gets to like what's now Turkey, he goes to Troy and visits the grave of Achilles. Right. You can still visit it today. It's a beautiful site that the Turkish government takes very good care of. And he went there and he sacrificed to Achilles and to the gods. And he and his friend Hephaestus stripped off their clothes and raced three times around uh, the city of Troy in imitation of Achilles and Hector in Homer's Iliad. So he takes back control of the Greek city-states in Persia, starts turning inland. The king of Persia this time was Darius. So Darius, like when did he realize that Alexander posed a threat and then he had to do something about this guy? Well, uh, Alexander fought a battle on the Granicus River near Troy uh, the first few weeks that he invaded. And they, the Persians thought, and that was just fighting a little local Persian army. The uh, Persians thought that that would take care of things. They would kill Alexander and that would be it. And they almost did kill Alexander. It was a very tough battle. But I think after Alexander took the Greek cities of Asia Minor, that's when Darius knew that th- this was something different. And that's when he began to gather his army. Uh, He didn't invade Asia Minor, Darius didn't with the Persian army, but he was waiting for him there. It took a long time to gather together the force uh, of the Persian army. And so Darius let Alexander basically take the rest of Asia Minor and go down the coast of what's now Syria and Israel, Palestine into Egypt. But he was waiting for him after he came into the area of what's now Iraq. So let's talk about his before. So he, he met Darius twice. The first time he did. there was a route like he basically routed Darius and Darius had to flee Right. Yes. The first time he fought him at a place called the, the Issus, at Issus, which is now just on the border of Turkey uh, and Syria. It's a, it was a, a great battle. Darius didn't even bring his entire army to this battle, but it was, it was huge. And Alexander was certainly outnumbered. And so Darius is, is heading towards Alexander. Alexander's heading toward Darius. They end up actually missing each other uh, in the fog of war. They get lost in different valleys. And, and so it turns out that Darius ends up uh, on the north of Alexander. Alexander's to the south. And so they're in a narrow valley. And one thing I tell my students is if you're ever in a situation where you're fighting a battle with an army that outnumbers you, especially one that outnumbers you greatly, try to restrict them to a small area because it negates somewhat their power. And this is what Alexander did. He fought the Battle of Issus on a narrow coastal plain so that Darius wasn't able to spread out his whole army and envelop Alexander. And so there at the Issus River, Alexander struck against Darius very fast and used the speed and used his flanking maneuvers and all of his different tricks and routed Darius. He drove Darius away. He was able to capture the tent uh, of Darius where all of his wives were, where his mother was. And he, he, 
treated them very, very well. That was one thing about Alexander is that he, uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, an act of chivalry, but it was also a very practical act that he treated them very well and sent them back to Persia unharmed and untouched. And he was able to win the first great battle at Issus and then eventually go forward from there down into Syria and Egypt. Well, that's kind of interesting thing you, you mentioned throughout the book about Alexander's relationship with women. It seemed to have like a soft spot for them. Like he wasn't interested in them romantically, it seemed like. Not to a great extent, uh, and it, it, not really. And sexual orientation in the ancient world is always a, a difficult thing to try because we look at it and to try to look at because we look at it in modern categories. But Alexander, he, he did get married eventually. He did have a child. He married more than once, actually. But women weren't, I, I don't think women were his obsession, certainly, like they were with his father, Philip, who would pretty much sleep with uh, anything wearing a skirt. But Alexander w- was more restrained, certainly. But yeah, he had like a respect for him. He was like very respectful, particularly to older women. Yes, he was very much so. So he continues down. So he routes Darius. Darius flees and he's like, oh, I'll take care of you later. I got other stuff to take care of. So he continues down the coast and he gets to where like modern Lebanon's at. And there's this island Tyre, which is one of the craziest campaigns probably in ever in like world military history. Tell us about what happened at Tyre. Well, Tyre was an island about a mile off the coast of what's now Lebanon. It had been a commercial center of the the, uh, Phoenicians, the the great trading people, the Phoenicians. They were an important part of the uh, Persian Empire. They were the main naval base of the Persians in the Mediterranean. They had this walled island, uh, as I said, about a mile off the coast, and it it had never been conquered. You you could not take uh, something like this. It had never been done before, so uh, Alexander sends a embassy to them. He's standing on the shore, basically says, you know, I want to come over and worship in the uh, temple of Hercules. And, you know, by the way, I want you to surrender. And they say, uh, nope, sorry, not going to do that because they are pretty sure that Darius is going to come back and crush Alexander with his entire army. So they say, no, we're not going to surrender. And if Alexander, you know, maybe he should have just moved on and left them there. But the problem is that they still controlled a very powerful navy. And so he would be heading heading south into Egypt with a powerful Persian navy still in force. And he couldn't do that. He had to take Tyre. He had to find some way to subdue this island city. Uh, And so what he did was something just uh, astounding. He built a causeway between the mainland and Tyre. And this is not some shallow sort of tidal bottomland between the mainland and the island. It was deep. And so he spent months, his men spent months pouring rocks into this channel. And the Tyrians, the people of Tyre, would just stand up on their walls and laugh at him for this. But as the months went by and the causeway got closer and closer, they stopped laughing. And eventually, Alexander was able to complete the causeway and roll his his machines of war right across it, along with all his soldiers and ladders, and they took the city of Tyre. And because the Tyrians had resisted, uh, he did the usual thing where he ended up killing or enslaving most of them. And it's no longer an island. Like you can still see the causeway there that right. Alexander built. Right. There's a, there's a, a picture. You, you can look at it online and, uh, and you can see that Tyre is now connected to the mainland as it has been for the last 2,300 years because of Alexander. It's a, a physical feature in the geography of the Middle East that Alexander created. So talking about this spiritual aspect of Alexander, an, an important part of his campaign was when he went to Egypt. Now, Egypt today is like, you know, we think of Egypt sort of this land of mystery. It was the same thing in Alexander's time. Egypt was seen as this land of mystery and magic and spirituality. And he gets to Egypt and he decides to go like on this month-long detour in the middle of the desert so he can go talk to an oracle. Right. He he conquered Egypt without any resistance. The Egyptians never particularly liked the Persians, so they were happy to proclaim Alexander as pharaoh and to, to show him around. And like everybody, Alexander was very impressed with Egypt. He went to the pyramids, and, and we have to realize that the pyramids were older to Alexander than he is to us. So there's an enormous antiquity to Egypt and, and mystery to it. So he left the Nile Valley, and he went 
far to the west to the oasis of Siwa, which is now on the border of, of Libya, uh, where there was a great uh, oracle of Amon-Ra, which the Greeks called Zeus. And so he went there on this dangerous journey that I think only a young man and his and his buddies would, would do crossing the uh, Sahara Desert. Uh, and he went there, though, to consult the oracle. And we don't know exactly what happened when he went into the oracle's temple. The story seems to be that Alexander wanted to know if Philip was his real father. And when he came out, people say that he seemed changed. And so the supposition is that the oracle told him that you were actually the son of Zeus. And so he went forth uh, at that point believing maybe that there was some actual truth to the story, that he was the son of a god. And so he went back to Egypt and then headed inland to invade the heart of the Persian Empire. Well, yeah, and supposedly he asked also if he would conquer the Persian Empire. Yes, yes. And, and, and uh, the oracle said, yes, indeed you will. Yeah, and that seemed to change him. Like he went, he left that profoundly affected and it gave him more gooster to keep doing what he had started to do. Right, because Alexander had gotten a message from Darius, the king of Persia, saying, let's work out a deal. You can keep the Mediterranean parts of my empire, which were really quite small and not particularly wealthy, and, and just stay there, and I will recognize you as, as king of the Mediterranean coast, and, and that's it. Uh, I think Darius uh, probably uh, intended to still conquer uh, Alexander, but he wa- wanted to buy some time. And, and Alexander, a lot of people said, Alexander, this is incredible. This is more than any of us could ever have hoped for. You've conquered Asia Minor, you've conquered Syria, you've conquered Egypt. Stop. This is enough. And Alexander said, no, I am going forward. Uh, And so his army, who were very loyal, followed him inland to the heart uh, of Mesopotamia, to the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. Yeah, as I read about that experience with Alexander, it made me think of like, there's a, if you look back in history, a lot of you know, what we'd call great individual, individuals, individuals that had a great impact on history, they had that in common with Alexander. Like they had a, a, a very powerful sense of purpose and identity. Right. And that they use that for good or evil, right? It could just depend on wh- how you look at it. Right. I mean, there's the modern theory, the great man theory of history, which is many historians sort of poopa. They say, no, it's not individuals who change history. It's economic and social forces. And of course, there's a lot of truth to that. But I, I disagree, I think, uh, with them to a certain extent. I think that there are certain men and women who really do change history, that, that really uh, make, that change everything. Julius Caesar was certainly one of these. Alexander was one of them. Napoleon was one of them. Certainly religious leaders, Muhammad, Jesus, uh, the Buddha. Uh, these are these are individuals who changed history. And so Alexander was, uh, was one of those. So as he was conquering these Persian cities, his empire was growing. Taking over things is easy. Managing is a lot harder. So how did, how did Alexander start managing his growing empire? What did he do? It's a part of Alexander's life that really isn't focused on very much, but he was a great administrator. What he did, first of all, was he kept most of the Persian apparatus for administering the empire intact. So the taxation, the administration of the individual provinces, uh, he kept the Persian civil servants and the other natives there. So he didn't disrupt things. He, he didn't come in and try to make everything Macedonian. He adapted it, very happily adapted it. And he also kept a constant flow of correspondence. So all of the time, all of these 11 years when Alexander was tromping across the mountains of of Afghanistan, he was getting constant reports about what kind of crops are growing in Phrygia or how things are going back in Macedonia. Uh, So he was able to dispatch and rule and administer the empire very effectively. And that that was really the key. Conquering an empire is hard enough, but keeping it can be impossible. We've seen many examples in history of people people who, who, who do that. Oh, and, and just you, you watch their empires fall apart when they die. Charlemagne, for example, he leaves his empire to three sons and then it just sort of collapses gradually uh, after he dies. So Alexander was a great administrator. But another thing that Alexander did besides maintaining the sort of current Persian apparatus, you know, political and religious and things like that, he also started adapting Persian customs and clothing. 
He did. He started wearing uh, Persian clothing, which I think in one sense was practical because it's really hot in Persia. So he started wearing pants, which uh, Macedonians wouldn't do. Greeks would never do that. So it was practical. But also a uh, part of it was that the people of, of the Persian empire that he conquered wanted a king who looked like a Persian king. Uh, and so he started dressing, at least in public displays, like a Persian king, which got some of his Macedonians who were very much a rough and ready, a bunch of cowboys sort of people thinking, you know, why is Alexander starting to act like a Persian? So that's created some tension. Yeah. So the Macedonians, they, they were a kingdom, but they were a lot more democratic than say the Persians. They were. I mean, you think, uh, when I think of the Macedonians, uh, I, I think about, uh, think about uh, Vikings. Uh, think about a, a hall full of Vikings with a king up front, uh, and all the warriors gathered around him proudly fighting for him, but doing it by their own will. And so it, it was a more democratic kind of institution than, than the Persian Empire, which was very much a hierarchical, top down, uh, sort of administration. So he continues just steamrolling through Persia. Uh, does he eventually kill Darius? Well, he uh, he doesn't eventually kill Darius. Somebody else does. But uh, after uh, the, the great battle at Galgamela in what's now uh, northern Iraq, where Alexander faced the entire Persian army, vastly outnumbered, and was able to defeat them by, uh, again, by just sheer daring and speed, then the army collapsed. And after that, Darius was a uh, king on the run uh, with just a few men with him, one of which uh, eventually killed him. Alexander didn't want to kill Darius. He wanted Darius to surrender to him. So he was very disappointed when he found the body of, of Darius somewhere in Iran uh, at an oasis at a caravan stop. Uh, and so um, eventually somebody else killed Darius and eventually then Alexander was the undisputed king uh, of, uh, of his new empire. All right, so he, he's taken over the Persian empire. What did his men think? He's like, all right, let's go home. We've been gone probably, what, how have they been long? Seven, eight years at this point? Yeah. At this point, they've gone through what's now Iran. They got stuck in Afghanistan, like pretty much every army does in history. For That was the toughest time that Alexander had was in Afghanistan. Uh, and then he goes down into what's now Pakistan and just across the border into modern India. And he's going to keep going. He says, all right, boys, let's go. We're going down the Indus River all the way to Cathay, to China, if we can. And, and they say, no, it's just, you know, it's, it's been almost 10 years. We want to go home. This is far enough. Make an end to your ambition. And so Alexander, when he hears this speech, he goes into his tent and sulks for three days and then finally says, okay, boys, you're right. It's time to go home. So he heads back to his new capital at Babylon in uh, what's now southern uh, Iraq. Yeah, the sulking thing. He's done that before and it worked. But this time it didn't work. This time it didn't work. Uh, this time he goes, uh, the, the men are just not going to follow him any farther. And so there's really not a whole lot Alexander can do at this point. He just, uh, he has to turn around. And so he does. And he's not giving up his uh, ambitions at all, but he is heading back at least for uh, a while uh, to Babylon. And what's interesting on his quest back, like instead of going back the way he went, he decided to go this like hard route because he heard that no one else had done it before. Yeah. And he was going to be, the, and there was that whole idea of Alexander, I'm going to do something that no one else has done before. Even if it might kill me, I'm going to do it. Yeah, he did. He went across this great uh, Gedrosian desert, which is a really kind of like death valley. He led his men across and some of them uh, didn't make it. But I think Alexander did it. Some people have said Alexander did this to punish his army. I don't think so. I think he did it because like you said, it hadn't been done before. Uh, and most of them made it. Uh, uh, he uh, he made it uh, back across the desert, back to Persepolis, and then back eventually to Babylon. And that's where his story ends. Like, how did Alexander die? Did he f meet the fate of like other previous Macedonian kings and get assassinated? Well, that's the question. Alexander had been sick before with what, and nobody really certain exactly what it was, maybe malaria, but he had been sick a number of times and recovered. He was also injured many times. Uh, he said, look at my body, I'm covered with scars. He was stabbed with swords and spears and always managed to pull out of it. So he's 32 years old and 
he's in Babylon and all of a sudden he comes down with a great fever uh, and uh, doesn't last all that long. And people ever since then have said, oh, he was poisoned or, or something happened. Uh, somebody killed him. Maybe. It's possible, but it's also very possible that Alexander, there was a lot of sickness in the ancient world, and it's very possible that Alexander was just weakened after all of these, these years of campaigning and just simply died of uh, disease there in, uh, in Babylon. Now, just like there's legends around his birth, there are also legends around his death particularly about who would succeed Alexander. Right. That's the great story, which I think is probably true. Uh, Alexander had married a, uh, a princess from the area of Afghanistan uh, and uh, eventually had a young son, but uh, that he, you know, he was just an infant. He wasn't able to take over the empire. So people wanted to know, his generals wanted to know, who are you leaving in charge of your empire, this vast empire you've created? And so they're all gathered around his deathbed and Alexander whispered, to them his last words. Uh, when they say, who are you going to leave it to? He says, to the strongest. And then he dies. Uh, that's the story, which uh, may be a little dramatic, but I think is probably true. And so after that, as you can imagine, there was chaos about who was going to take over Alexander's empire. So what happened at the empire? Well, his his generals divided it up. What happened was uh, one of them took the eastern part, the uh, parts of India and Persia. Another took Asia Minor area. Another took Macedonia. And then his old friend, his best and oldest friend, Ptolemy, took Egypt, which was uh, probably the smartest move of all because it was a, a very wealthy and very contained and easy to defend kingdom. And so Ptolemy and his descendants ruled Egypt for several hundred years until his very last descendants that Cleopatra was uh, taken over, uh, surrendered to Rome. And what happened to Macedonia itself? Macedonia itself sort of fell back. It, it remained, uh, it was uh, given to one of uh, Alexander's generals, but it continued to exert a lot of influence. It was still powerful, but it really, it, it started to fall apart at that point. Certainly the empire part did, and it wasn't that long afterwards uh, until uh, Rome was a rising power in the West, uh, and they certainly did their best to uh, bring down Macedonia uh, if they could. And so Macedonia itself reverts to being uh, what it had been been before, which is a, a fairly small kingdom, and all the rest of Alexander's empire is divided up into uh, among different generals who found dynasties. But uh, but the thing is, Alexander's influence continued. Alexander not only conquered, but he established cities, he established libraries, he settled his veteran soldiers in colonies uh, all the way to Afghanistan and India. So these little centers of Greek civilization, all in these cities, basically named Alexandria after himself. He founds all across his former empire, and they become a great center for, for Hellenic, for Greek culture uh, that greatly influenced uh, the, the area for, for centuries thereafter. Yeah, how did it set the stage for Western civilization after that point, you think? Well, what Alexander did, uh, before Alexander, Greek civilization was pretty much contained in in Greece, so Gre the, the Aegean area. But Alexander spread Greek civilization, the stories of Homer, the philosophy of, of Plato, uh, across uh, the ancient world to Egypt, to, uh, uh, to uh, Mesopotamia, to India. Uh, and so uh, when we think about the golden age of Greece and the, the wonderful... Uh, plays and books and histories and all, uh, Alexander is really responsible for spreading that. Uh, and then the Romans took it up and they uh, they helped spread it uh, even more. But Alexander founded these cities, the greatest of which was the Alexandria of Egypt, which became uh, the intellectual center of the ancient world, uh, where people from all over the place uh, came, where this great library for the collection and dissemination of knowledge uh, was founded. Uh, and so uh, Alexander spread read civilization, uh, really Greek civilization, uh, at least uh, all across uh, the uh, the ancient world. And so that people spoke Greek, not everybody, uh, they still spoke their native languages. But uh, we look at the New Testament, for example, written, uh, written in the uh, in the first century uh, of our era, it's written in Greek, it's not written in the Aramaic of Jesus, it's written in Greek, the, the Greek of Alexander. So you mentioned that people often looked Alexander for leadership lessons for business or for military. And so Alexander the Great, is like, he's an interesting character because as I was reading your, your biography of him, I'd be like, wow, this is really cool. And then he would just like basically commit genocide. And you're like, ooh, yep. that's not good. Um, so like, so you kind of walk away ambivalent about him. What, but what do you think are the lessons 
that people can take from Alexander the Great on leadership? Well, I mean, it's a tough question. It's a question we deal with in, in, in college courses all the time when we study people from the past and then we find out something terrible about them, that they own slaves, for example. What do we do with somebody like that? What do we do with George Washington, who did all these amazing things and yet uh, owned and oppressed uh, individual people? It's a tough question. So uh, what I try to do is I say, try to look at the context of the times, because otherwise we're going to end up ignoring everybody from history. We're going to end up canceling everybody. So look at Alexander in his own times and what he did. He did some pretty horrible stuff, but he did some amazing stuff too. And and learning leadership lessons from him. The thing, uh, watch how he fought. He was never an armchair general. He was always there in the front. There was a city he invaded in India. He was the first one over the wall into this hostile city. So uh, he always was in front, always facing physical dangers, always taking care of his men before himself, uh, always very well organized, but also very daring. So I think, you know, those are some lessons that, that all of us can apply to our lives. And his, like, his, his overlooked idea of he was a good administrator, there's probably lessons from, lessons from that as well. Right. Absolutely. Well, Phil, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about the book and the rest of your work? Well, uh, they can go to philipfreemanbooks.com. I have a nice little website uh, that some very kind people put together, and uh, that talks about uh, all my different books. I've got books on Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Sappho, St. Patrick, and uh, some other things, too. So uh, I would welcome people uh, to go there. I'm also on Facebook uh, under Philip Freeman Books. All right. Philip Freeman, thanks so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks very much. My guest it was Philip Freeman. He's the author of the book, Alexander the Great. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, philipfreemanbooks.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Alexander the Great, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 